In this video, I'm going to dive into Alex Pereira's knockout against Jamal Hill, discussing the biomechanics and the anatomy behind what makes him so powerful and how he generates that power when he fights. To set the stage, we have to point out something that I don't think is measurable at this point, but what I think is a foundational component to Alex's ability to produce power. And this has to do with genetically determined muscle attachments. Muscles usually have two main attachments, a proximal attachment and a distal attachment. Depending on the muscle and the movement you're trying to perform, one of the attachments is stationary, and the other moves a bone towards that stationary attachment, creating movement. If we use the bicep, doing a bicep curl as an example, the attachment up at the shoulder is stationary, and the attachment on the forearm is moving the forearm closer to the shoulder. So I'm going to show you some very simple biomechanical math using a force production calculator to show you just how much muscle attachments matter when talking about the potential to produce force. Alright, so following up with the example with the bicep, bicep represents a third class lever in the body. Okay, So let's just kind of make sure that we're oriented. This fulcrum here would be the bend in your arm. The W stands for the weight, so you'd be holding a weight here. The length 1, noted down here, would be the length of your forearm, and then length 2 would be the length or the, the length of the distance between the fulcrum of the forearm and your muscle attachment. Okay? And then the force is what we're going to calculate or what we'll see down here. So essentially we're going to see how the second length, the, the length of the muscle attachment, affects how much force we need to produce to move the same amount of weight. So for down here, we have weight at 20 pounds, right? So we're doing a 20 pound bicep curl. And since Pereira and Hill had the same exact wing, wingspan, and they were the same exact height, I don't think this is a super far off thing to consider, okay? So known distance one, the length of the forearm, we're just gonna put 18 inches, was about a foot and a half. This is just an arbitrary guess, but we're gonna keep these things the same. What we're gonna change is the length Okay, so this would represent the muscle attachment. So let's say Jamal Hill had a bicep tendon that attached 2.5 inches away from the elbow okay, or the fulcrum. So if we hit calculate, that means that it would be 144 pounds of force created by the bicep in order to lift a 20 pound weight. All right, so let's say that if we increase this by just half an inch, okay, which is pretty pretty long distance whenever it comes to anatomical uh, distances, but let's just say half an inch, all right? So three inches, and then we'll hit calculate. Now only 120 pounds of force is needed to lift the same amount of weight. So we can see that if we just change this a little bit, right? And this is just one muscle. If he's got genetically good muscle attachments. This can account for all the muscles that are used in the upper and lower body in the trunk to produce force for Pereira, okay? So length, the further away the force is from the fulcrum, the less force is used or is needed to lift the same amount of weight. So think about it. Pereira and Hill could be using the same amount of force whenever they do some of these things. Athleticism aside and coordination aside, it's going to feel very different if all of the muscles have a little bit better of a muscle attachment, he's got much more leverage when he produces force. And that is how leverage and muscle attachments can affect the amount of force that you're putting through a certain limb in the body, like during a punch. So this is a big part of what allows people to be a lot stronger than they look. Now I'm not saying Alex doesn't look good, but he's long and he's not super muscular. So again, this is just speculation, but I wouldn't be shocked if it were the case that he was really genetically gifted when it comes to his muscle attachments. And the second aspect of Alex's ability to produce power is something that is also largely genetically determined, and that is his muscle fiber types. Type 1, more commonly known as slow twitch muscle fibers, are much more dense with mitochondria and can produce more energy over a longer period of time, making them better for longer aerobic exercise. Type 2 muscle fibers or fast twitch muscle fibers are used for very quick bursts of movement, requiring much less oxygen than type 1 muscle fibers. Now most fighters are going to skew mainly towards type 2, and I would bet that Alex has a genetic makeup with a higher percentage of type 2 muscle fibers than most. Now this is where the real magic happens. You can have all the good muscle attachments and all the good muscle fibers you want. It doesn't necessarily mean you can coordinate your movement in an athletic way, but Pereira definitely can. Let's break down that knockout against Jamal Hill. All right, here's what we really want to see here. And this is going to be very reminiscent of Ryan Garcia whenever I looked at his video and broke that down. Whenever you see a lot of similarities in the way that they shift their weight, turn their hips, and their thoracic spine, okay? So let's just start. Like any good striker, we talked about this last time, the idea of a spring, right? So whenever we put that, plant that back leg for this lead hook here, or lead kind of hook cut thing, I don't know, it's kind of like coming up across his head. But he plants his foot 
and shifts his weight to his front leg. So right there, his front leg is loaded. It's very subtle, but this is where a lot of the power comes from, just like the Garcia punch, right? Those hips come forward, very subtle. Boom, right there. So weight has been shifted to the front leg, center of mass is moving forward, uses the hips to generate a little bit more compression in that spring, right? To generate a little bit more potential energy to be delivered uh, kinetically whenever he wants, right? So now his thoracic spine is a little bit preloaded into left uh, thoracic rotation, and he's got that arm about to load up, boom, right there. So he's in a, a position called horizontal abduction, right? But he's actually not doing that. These are just, I, it's just isometric. He's also got a little bit of scapular retraction going for, for shoulder stability to make sure that he's nice and loaded, right? The thoracic, like the rhomboids in the middle trap, uh, are secondarily rotating on the other side, this thoracic spine, along with the, a lot of the lumbo-pelvic muscles that we've talked about, like the internal and external obliques, quadratus lumborum. You've got all the erector spinae uh, that play a role when it comes to lumbo-pelvic control. But since these hips are preloaded and or ha hips have been brought forward and the thoracic spine is preloaded and there's a nice isometric contraction up at the shoulder and the shoulder girdle, he then decides to deliver the punch concentrically. It's a little bit of shoulder flexion, but mainly horizontal adduction with the pec and the anterior delt. Uh, and he's using a, a fair amount of bicep here as well for, for the portion of this that is shoulder flexion. Uh, and then he makes contact with Hill's face there. And what, how you know that he's generated a fair amount of force here with, with a, a really weird angle punch is if we let it come to the other side, right there. He's actually making contact with his pinky and his ring finger. Anybody who's ever trained knows that you want to try and hit with the first, second, maybe the third knuckle. Uh, so it travels down the, the metacarpal. There's a, there's a, it's a little bit easier for the force distribution to go through the metacarpals and through the carpal bones and the wrist and all the way up the kinetic chain into the shoulder girdle. Uh, and then, you know, we fast, give it a little bit more and bruh, this man sees God. Okay, <laughs> there's just nothing he could have done. Okay, so one more time, all the way through, plants, shifts weight to the front leg, hips come forward, thoracic spine pre-rotated, nice isometric contraction in the shoulder girdle, and whenever he wants, he concentrically brings that into horizontal abdu adduction, adduction, and shoulder flexion using the anterior delt, bicep, upper pec, makes contact with Jamal Hill's face. We don't get that really big rotational component, so Jamal Hill's mouth is open, and if you're not biting down a lot, sometimes that can be associated with a, a higher likelihood of being knocked out. Uh, since you're not generating a lot of tension in the jaw, uh, and we know from the physiology of a knockout video that I've done before, uh, we, that quick rotational movement is what's can, or we know that leads more than likely leads to the acute loss of consciousness via a, uh, concept called mechanoporation via a really strong stretch in the nervous system, uh, those nerves that kind of lead up to the brain and uh, conduct that signal that keeps us conscious for that certain amount of time. But he makes contact with his pinky and ring finger because he's got so much power it doesn't matter how he would have made contact. Before I leave you guys, I want to reiterate that it's pretty much impossible to know just how much any of these variables contribute individually to an athlete's success. This is why it's so hard to predict or measure something like athleticism. These are just some of the things I'm thinking about whenever I'm watching a lot of these high-level athletes perform. You guys have been doing a great job with the suggestions, so keep them coming in the comments for more athletic movements to analyze or anything like that. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.